Have you ever thought about what causes a flood? Now you might think that's easy. Bunch of rain, excess of water, low-lying areas, hurricanes, storms. That's what cause floods. But of course I'm talking about something a little bit different. I want you to think for a moment or two this morning about the great flood, the one of Noah's day, the cataclysm, the old writers called it, the destruction of the world that then was. What caused it? Rain? Water? Low-lying geography? Genesis chapter 6 tells us what caused the flood, and the answer will tie together not only the terrible floods we've seen in our time, but also the events of more recent times in our world, like what happened in Buffalo and what happened in Texas in recent days, and similar things, things we would call great tragedies in recent history. So I hope that thought is interesting to you, and I want us to listen to the Word of God together for a few minutes here at the beginning from Genesis chapter 6. Start reading in the first verse there. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. You might remember that one of the things... God the Creator asked Adam and Eve to do was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So as we read in Genesis 6, we are now many hundreds of years after that command. And did you notice in that reading how mankind had filled the earth? Verse 11 says, with violence. The earth was filled with violence. The earth was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. The wickedness of man was great in the earth. And it says that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. I want to describe a scene to you that happens to me occasionally. Maybe it'll sound familiar to you. You wake up early. You go to the kitchen, sort of bleary-eyed, 
Maybe put the coffee on. Maybe pour some cereal in a bowl with some milk. To top it all off, you get the bag of bread out and you reach in for a slice or two to plop into the toaster and you look and there are green spots all over that bread. Mold. Yuck. Now, I will confess to you, what I have done sometimes is to search down through that, that loaf and try and find a clean piece somewhere. But all too often, the whole loaf is corrupt, isn't it? And it all goes into the trash, and, and your heart is sort of broken. Now, I wouldn't suggest at all that, that moldy bread is a tragedy anywhere near the same level as what we see in Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Noah. But the principle of corruption uh, remains. What causes floods? What caused the flood? Corruption. Evil. Wickedness. Violence. God in, in the days of Noah looks at his world and I want you to notice how many times in that passage we read where it says that God saw or God saw the earth. So God is not now nor has he ever been separate from his creation. There are those who suggest that and have through time that he's he sort of made it, wound it up, and then let it go. God is not separate from his creation. He knows what's happening. He sees what's happening. And he is affected by what he sees. And so don't miss the emotion of God in this text. When God looks at his world and sees what's going on, he is sorry. He's sorry. He regrets that he ever made it. He regrets that he ever made them. And he's grieved in his divine heart. God is heartsick over the condition of the world. He's sorry he made them. Did you know that the heart of God is torn up by what he sees his creatures do sometimes? Well, what are they doing on, in, in this passage? In addition to the general statements of their sin that we already quoted, there, there's some kind of corruption of marriage going on in the first four verses of that passage. I'm not going to get into exactly what was happening there because I'm not sure that we know, but God's not pleased. He's not pleased with marriages in general, what they were producing in his world. It sounds like... They were producing, well, one thing, they were producing bullies, men and women of violence. Bullying is not a modern phenomenon. The word Nephilim there in verse 4 ought to be translated fallen ones. These were people who had fallen from God. Even in this ancient time, a very different world, pre-flood, you see, marriages are a big deal. They play a big role in the general spiritual health of mankind. When, when the world falls apart, marriages have fallen apart first. Families. When the world is in trouble, families have been in trouble. And so there's wickedness and evil thoughts and violence and corruption everywhere. And God says... Man's days are now numbered, verse 3. And he says, I'm going to blot man out, erase him from the earth, verse 7. But there's one bright spot in all this wickedness and corruption. Noah, a righteous man, a standout. A man who has not fallen, 
but indeed, it says, walks with God. God graciously decides to rescue Noah and his family from this destruction. Eight people are saved. God didn't have to do that. He didn't have anybody to answer to on that. He graciously saves. He could have thrown Noah away with the entire spoiled world, but God, the text says that Noah finds grace in God's eyes. Now, usually when we approach the, the flood story, we focus on Noah, and for good reason. He's a great example of faith and endurance and, and obedience. But I really want us today to focus on this question, what causes floods? Again, is it too much water? Low-lying cities? Is it climate change? Is it hurricanes, storms, busted dams? Or... Taking a more theological tack, is it an angry God? Is it a broken-hearted God? Is that what causes floods? That God is offended? Well, you might read this passage and come away saying that. And it's not a totally unreasonable view. God is good, he is righteous and holy and pure, and indeed, we know from Scripture, he cannot abide sin. So one might say that God causes floods. If that's true, though, it's not the full truth. Even in this passage, I want you to look a little bit more closely with me at what is actually said in the text in chapter 6, comes in verses 11, 12, and 13. And it centers around these words that recur of violence and corruption. We're told twice that the earth was filled with violence. Have things changed any? I was moved to think about these things this week by the terrible violence we have seen. The violence that we saw in that elementary school in Texas and then before that in that grocery store in Buffalo. And it would not be hard to name many other examples, would it, that surround us. And there's, of course, a terrible war going on in Ukraine now and who knows what comes tomorrow? Would anything shock us in this world? And God is a God of peace. And he hates violence. He hates what happened in that classroom. Violence assumes brute force applied to innocent or unsuspecting victims. And God, Scripture tells us, is a defender of the weak and the innocent and the helpless. And in the days of Noah, it had gotten so bad, apparently, that, that everybody was violent and unjust and oppressive except this one man, this one shining example and God couldn't tolerate this anymore in his creation so the word violence is important and then we have the word corruption God looked at the earth and it was corrupt all flesh was corrupt the word means something like spoiled beyond repair Beyond fixing, destined for the trash bin. Remember the creation story of chapter 1 of Genesis. How did God, at the end of each day, describe his work, his creation? Remember, it says, behold, it was good. Then at the end of creation week, behold, it was very good. 
Well, not so anymore in the days of Noah. Now, the once good earth is corrupt, it's marred, it's spoiled. And so we come to the last verse of, of this passage, verse 13, and it's unfortunate, I think, the way that the newer translations have rendered what the text actually says, and I think it's an important issue. Here's what it actually says in verse 13. God said to Noah, an end to all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence from them, and I am corrupting them with the earth. God does not say, I have decided to put an end to all flesh. What he says is, the end of all flesh has come before me. See, man's sin and wickedness and rebellion that's what did the corrupting, the, the spoiling, the marring of God's good world. And then the very same word used three times in verses 11 and 12, this word corrupt. That's what God says he's allowing to happen to mankind and, and to the earth. He's allowing them to be spoiled, to be ruined, to be corrupted. And so a flood of waters comes over the earth, a, a deluge, a, a cataclysm. And as a result, the earth is purged, purified, made new. What causes floods? Well, mankind causes floods. Their sin, their rebellion, the wickedness of their hearts, their violence, all of it spoils the good that God intended for his creation. And God eventually lets things take their course and lets it all fall apart. Now, the point is not, let me be very clear, the point is not that those poor children in Texas or the people in Buffalo or, or the innocents in Ukraine got flooded because of their sins. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying and please don't misunderstand God's word to suggest that. The point is, that things like the violence in Uvalde or, or countless other places, big and small, every day, that breaks God's heart. It grieves him. It is not his will. And there have been times, the biggest one being in the days of Noah, where God just... Let the world be swept away in its corruption. Remember, Scripture says, the wages of sin is death. We live in a world increasingly full of violence. God is brokenhearted over that. We should not be shocked at what we're seeing. It is the inevitable result of falling away from God. It is the result of evil hearts and rampant wickedness. It is what happened in the days of our ancient brother Noah. So, is there a great physical flood coming again? No. You know, we can have bad storms, we can have floods, and that can be awful at times, but, but those pale in comparison to what happened in the great flood of Noah's day, a, an event that literally destroyed the world that then was, that's not happening again. 
But something is coming. As we close, I just want to remind you of a few things that Jesus and his men said. Jesus said one time, as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now hear what he says. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Something is coming. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said this in one of his letters. He said, for they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by me means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Indeed, there is another flood of sorts coming. Flood of fire and judgment and destruction. And, and finally, Peter again, this time in his first letter, speaks of this. He says, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, Eight persons were brought safely through water. Baptism, which now corresponds to this, saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Noah's day, eight people were saved from the flood by getting on an ark. In our day, as we look for the return of the Son of God, we realize that a, a different kind of flood is on the way. And, and we realize, hopefully, that there is a place of safety from that. It is in Jesus Christ. And we don't know how many will be saved on that ark that is Christ. But we know how to get on board By getting into Christ. And we get into Christ by being baptized into Christ. It's ironic, isn't it, that you can, you can choose to be buried in water. That is, buried with Christ, and that will keep you safe from the cataclysm that, that is on its way to this world. This world which has fallen away from God and totally corrupted its way. I hope today that everyone here is in that safe place in the arms of Jesus. But if not, time still remains. But I want you to understand something's coming. The clock is ticking and there's a place of safety. If we can help you today, get on board. Let us know how. While together we stand and sing.